<clears throat> Welcome everyone. We're gonna wait a few moments and allow people time to connect and join us. Welcome, welcome, bienvenidos. Welcome everyone. We still have many folks connecting to join us. So we're gonna to continue to wait a few moments. Welcome, welcome. All right, I think we are officially going to begin. Hello everyone, hola, buenos noches. Um, and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Raptor Migration by the Millions and the Methods Behind the Numbers, presented to you by our international team of experts throughout the Latin American and Mesoamerican Flyway, representing some of the largest raptor migration count sites in the world. Joining us this evening, we have Ernesto Ruelas, who is the founder of Veracruz River of Raptors and also a current Hawk Mountain board member. Welcome, Ernesto. Hola, Jamie. Also joining us, we have Kashmir Wolf, who is the monitoring coordinator at Veracruz River of Raptors. Bienvenido a Kashmir. Hola, bienvenidos todos. Gracias por sintonizarse. Y ahora vamos a volar un poquito más sur a Costa Rica. And we have joining us David Araya y Julio Madrid. Uh, representing Kekolde Raptor Migration Count Site in Costa Rica. Welcome, David y Julio. Hello, team. How is it going? I hope you enjoy this experience. Hola, mucho gusto. Pura vida. Gracias por estar acá. Wonderful. And also joining us, we have Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's very own Sarkis Sakopian, Director of Conservation Science, Dr. Lori Goodrich. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, Jamie. Hello, everyone. Buenas noches. And my name is Jamie Dawson, and I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Thank you all so much for joining us today. As you may be aware, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey, and we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education, locally and globally. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you so very much for your continued support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk, Ma Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy and has a wonderful year of 2023. And we are absolutely thrilled to be able to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. And at any time during the program, viewers may submit their questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. We designated some time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. Y también puede hacer preguntas en español. Y vamos a traducir conceptos importantes durante el programa. And now um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lori Goodrich, who's going to talk with us briefly about the importance of utilizing consistent protocols when collecting data, such as raptor migration counts. And also she's going to introduce each individual speaker tonight and share uh, the topic that they are going to be presenting. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Lori. Thank you, Jamie. And I thank everyone for being here. Um, we've been talking about doing this program for a little while now, and it's a little unusual in that we have several speakers, but actually I think it's going to be very exciting um, because one of the big questions that roams around in Hawk County world is how do they count those birds when they're flying over? these mega flyways like Veracruz and Kekledi. So uh, that's the subject of our discussion today. And um, before we get into that, let me just give a little bit of background on Hawk Mountain's connection to these sites. 
since the early 1990s, Hawk Mountain has been collaborating with interns and former interns and trainees around the world to help establish raptor migration count sites and environmental education outreach programs within migration concentration areas. Uh, but we've particularly been active from Mexico South through Northern South America. And we've had uh, former trainees starting sites um, for, for at least different six different sites from Mexico South through Colombia uh, as recently as um, the last couple of years. So if you think about all these sites and all this effort that's being put in by our trainees, our former trainees around the world, um, it's really astounding. There's, we estimate about 13 million raptors are being counted annually at these sites. Uh, so it's a big effort and it's very important. Um, and in our discussions with these groups, we've been starting to have a, a uh, focus group of leaders at these different sites uh, discussing and having meetings about twice a year. We've realized that um, it might be good to kind of discuss how these protocols and, and methods for counting these raptors as they migrate over have been have been developed and, and how, how different sites are approaching that the problem or that wonderful problem of counting millions of birds going over their heads. Uh, all of our sites, of course, are using Hawk Mi Migration Association North America standardized uh, skeleton protocols, but they've had to obviously change things in order to address this, this issue of high vol volumes of birds. And it's really something that we haven't had to address in North America too often. So that's kind of a background on what we're trying to do today. And I hope at the end of the program, at everybody's uh, program, you'll be able to uh, ask some questions or maybe there'll be some discussion about your perspective as well. So um, the first speaker, uh, I'm, as, as, as Jamie mentioned, is uh, Ernesto Rallis in Zunza. It was a, one of our first, was the, um, founder of the Veracruz River Raptors Project, but also serves currently on our Hawk Mountain Board of Directors. And I was thrilled that we were able to get him to come today because um, if you he can sort of reflect on how things got started. And Veracruz was one of the first, was the first site to try to develop a standardized raptor count. So I'd like to turn it over to Ernesto and have him uh, start us off. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, thank you, Jamie, and thank you, everybody, for attending this program. I'm going to uh, make a really brief introduction about how we developed our methods to track migration at a site that is very different from other sites where we have studied birds in, in uh, North America. Uh, so first off, I would like to say that the methods to track raptors in Veracruz have developed over the years. Uh, some of them have been uh, the trial and error type things. Uh, this is our particular experience in the River of Raptors project uh, that is, as many of you know, a, a three decade long collaboration between Pro Natura Veracruz, Hawk Watch International and Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Uh, for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with the story of Veracruz, uh, our site uh, is located at, uh, along the uh, Gulf Coastal Plain of Mexico. Uh, there, uh, we have uh, a lot of thermal convection that aggregates the flights of migratory raptors up to the point in central Mexico, and I hope everybody can see my pointer, uh, uh, in, in the central part of the state of Veracruz, where the uh, mounts of the Sierra Madre Oriental and, the, uh, and a chain of volcano called the Central Volcanic Belt meet. Uh, that creates a bottleneck for, for raptors on migration. And this area has been the subject of studies over a really long time. The first uh, recorded uh, observations of migration came from Frank Chapman uh, from the American Museum of Natural History in 1897. Uh, later on, there is a, a long and interesting dis uh, description of turkey vulture flights uh, made by Purdue in 1972. Uh, uh, Jean-Marc Thiolet, uh, French uh, researcher, did uh, some investigations uh, on the raptor migration here between 1979 and the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, Ralph Palmer discovered uh, some correspondence uh, coming from the 1950s about uh, really interesting uh, and impressive flights of Broadwind hawks uh, taking place just south of Veracruz City. 
Uh, Fred Tilly came and did some additional observations in 1985 and 1987. Uh, Lori Goodrich herself was here uh, in the spring of 1989 doing some uh, estimations of the volume of raptors. And up until this time, uh, there wasn't a true need to make a consistent count. Everything that was being done at the time were uh, estimates of how uh, how many uh, migrants were flying by and what species and so on. Uh, and it is quite a challenging uh, flight here. Uh, as you have probably heard in many other uh, programs or videos or papers, uh, the uh, volume of migration here is outstanding. Veracruz aggregates about 4.5 billion raptors uh, during a full season. Uh, and, uh that volume of raptors is not the only difference of what we have here. Some of the most important and striking differences of hawk migration between the temperate zone and that of the tropics are, for example, species composition. Uh, our flights uh, south of Texas uh, and up until uh, you reach uh, northern South America are, are dominated by turkey vultures, broadened hawks, swainson's hawks, and Mississippi kites. Many other shorter distance migrants come along uh, these four uh, main species, but for the most part, our flights are dominated by large uh, flocking species. The quantities uh, and the, uh, these aggregations uh, mean that uh, anything that is worth looking at here uh, is, is a site that has uh, more than 100,000 birds per site. Uh, anything else is probably erratic, is irregular, uh, and uh, the sites that we are currently tracking in uh, in Mexico, in Costa Rica, in Panama, in Colombia, are sites that uh, track more than half a million birds per season. Uh, the flight behavior is also something very different. Uh, most of the migrants that we record here are thermal soaring, and I'll be talking about this in just a bit. 95% uh, of them or more are uh, using thermals for migration. And traditional uh, concept of using leading uh, or diversion lines such as mountain reaches or shorelines is something that needs to be uh, reconsidered when you come to the uh, to the tropics so uh, your conceptions of of uh, what aggregates or diverts migration in the north uh, need to be thought of uh, once again when you uh, reach the tropics some of the initial challenges that uh, any project that is tracking migration uh, in the tropics uh, is, is facing a few things. For example, visual counts or estimates versus other methods. Are we truly counting hawks here? And the answer is no. We are we're estimating. Uh, we are doing uh, uh, educated estimates of uh, the migrants that are flying through. And that differs from other methods that were used uh, back in the mid-1970s to early 1980s for example, in Panama, where uh, Neil Smith and his team of collaborators collected and, and uh, uh, assembled their numbers using photo or video or film documentation of the flights of migrants over the Isthmus of Panama. And that raised uh, this, this uh, uh, answer to my original question of whether we're counting or estimating uh, leads us to another thing. Uh, and the important question here is, can estimates accurately reflect spatial and, tem and temporal aspects of migration? Are, are those counts, are those estimates precise enough to do uh, useful things with that data? And uh, for example, uh, are data appropriate for trend analysis, which is an important question for us sustaining discounts year after year? Uh, another interesting question is how good are observers in estimating large numbers of whatever, birds, uh, people in the stadium, people in the streets. Uh, research from uh, visual psychologists basically tells humans uh, we are uh, particularly poor at estimating uh, large numbers of things. Uh, and uh, so some of our questions were, um, can we develop experience? Can we train the observer's eye either through slides, videos, software, or some other ways to get better at estimating uh, large numbers of migrating things. So we run a few tests here and there, and uh, we'll talk about them uh, throughout this program. Uh, another interesting question uh, 
monitoring sites are always challenged by trying to reduce costs. Uh, so the question of having one, two, or, or more observers is an important one. Uh, do we need to have uh, two observers? Do we need to have three? Do we need to have more? What happens when you uh, have a site that is understaffed? What happens when you have a, a site that is overstaffed? Uh, the current methodology at the River of Retros project that Kashmir, my colleague, will be talking to you about uh, are, are two sites that are located perpendicular to the migration front of the migration. Uh, uh, presumably, these two uh, sites are uh, providing two different replicates of the same flow of migrants. Uh, the current protocol at the River of Raptors project uh, includes having three observers per site. There is a, a rotation system, so observers are moving uh, between the two sites and taking a day off uh, in that rotation system ensures that the error that is brought in by uh, the different skill of observers at least gets uh, distributed, distributed evenly uh, between sites. Uh, the current protocol uh, holds uh, uh, two main observers and one assistance. And again, to reiterate, uh, we do estimates and not counts. Uh, one, one interesting thing when you're counting flocking migrants is when is the time to count? Uh, you have probably seen videos, photos, or diagrams of these swarms and flocks of migrants who are uh, climbing uh, the lower uh, boundary layer of the atmosphere uh, in, in thermals. Uh, and those uh, those uh, swarming uh, migrants are very difficult to track because they, they turn around in a circle and enter your field of view again. So it's very difficult to count them then. Uh, the good thing is that they exit those thermals when they reach a certain height and start the glide, and that is the time to count. So when they are streaming, moving between thermals is when you do your counts and estimates. Uh, take, for example, this observer uh, who is placed in, in one of our sites in Cardel, and she's looking at a large flock, uh, 500 and some birds in this, uh, in this photograph. Uh, so what she's doing, uh, she has a clicker counter in her left hand, and she basically uh, is trying to estimate what, what, uh, how many birds are mi migrating through. Uh, so what she does is to directly count uh, a number of them, let's say five. Uh, once she's done uh, counting those five migrants, she uh, draws an imaginary circle around those five birds and then uh, extrapolates that circle to uh, the entire flock until she comes up with an estimate. Uh, for each circle of migrants, she does a click in the uh, clicker counter that she has. And later on, you uh, take a look at your clicker counter and write down the number times five. Sometimes you do uh, clicks by threes, by fives, by tens, by fifties. Uh, it gets really busy at times. So uh, what happens uh, with that is that the precision of estimates varies depending on how many birds you are counting. So based on our experiments with photographs, experiments with video, uh, and, and experiments with software, when you're counting units, uh, and I hope everybody can see my pointer here, your precision is, is quite good. When you're counting less than 30 or 40 birds, you're almost uh, uh, counting, uh, or, or you're actually doing uh, a precise count. Uh, you're very, very close to the exact number of migrants. That's also because you can count once and then count again. And sometimes the flight allows you to count uh, even three times and, and your, your uh, initial number is often revised. When you're counting uh, tens of migrants, your uh, tendency uh, uh, is to overestimate a little bit. So when you're when I'm talking about tens of migrants, uh, I'm thinking about uh, 160, 180 migrants coming at a time. Uh, you're overestimating by the order of uh, five, seven, nine percent. I forgot the actual numbers. A lot of these data are lost. Uh, but uh, when you're counting uh, tens, you overestimate uh, for slightly less than 10%. Uh, when you're counting by the hundreds, you start underestimating by the order of 
and you're when you're counting uh, thousands of migrants, you're underestimating by the order of 40%. Uh, these error bars in the graph um, uh, mean that uh, the flight itself uh, uh, has a lot of a, a great degree of error. Uh, there is a lot of variation between how many uh, migrants uh, uh, can be recorded in either a photographic sample, a video sample, or a software sample. Uh, and but this is a curve that uh, that we generated with data from from the um, uh, mid 90s to late 90s. Uh, we also did uh, some comparisons between what uh, one observer versus two observers and two observers versus three observers can record. Uh, we wanted to figure out if the number of people in the team makes a difference. And we found that the dotted line is uh, a team of two observers and the, the, uh, the continuous line is a team of uh, three observers. So uh, we came up with the conclusion that having two observers is better than one, having three observers is better than two, uh, but the difference between two and three observers is not that huge, and, re and it records approximately uh, the same uh, passage dates and the same passage pattern uh, than, than two observers do. So with this, uh, I don't want to make this a, a really long discussion. I'd rather uh, leave it to uh, to Cash to continue developing this, these ideas. I believe this is, yeah, this is it for me. Thanks, Ernesto. Uh, we'll have time for questions and discussion at the end after everybody's uh, given their talk. Our next speaker is Kashmir Wolf and Kashmir, um, is the Veracruz River Raptors Monitoring Coordinator. He's been doing that for a while, and it's his job to both hire, supervise, and train the new counters and old counters at Veracruz. So he's gonna share a little bit about how the count is done today and some of the training that they do with their observers. Thank you so much, uh, Lori, and thanks everyone for joining. And yeah, let's, let's get into how we do things here in, in Veracruz. So I want you to to take a bit like when is much when much is some, is too much. Well, you have to you have to experience for yourself that is something that can even change people's minds and completely. So it's something that we have to experience, and not only with birds but many other things. So as uh, Ernesto was talking about. So the Veracruz, you may say, well, Panama is more narrow, also Costa Rica is more narrow. But what happened here in Mexico is that we have the geographical barriers. So we have this uh, Gulf of Mexico that our uh, soaring raptors try to avoid. And then we have the, the mountain, the Sierra Madre. And the Sierra Madre is going to be cloudy during the fall most of the time, so that enable uh, or limits the thermal conditions. So basically, what is left for the birds to, to migrate through is that part in between the mountains and the Gulf of Mexico. And, and yeah, this, uh, the great thermal conditions is one of the key like the ingredients for this uh, phenomenon happen here and then be at the right place. So as you can see, we are right at the bottom of uh, that uh, bottleneck and that creates a great opportunity to monitor this uh, huge amount of migratory birds. Y tantito en español, no para las personas que se conectan en que hablan español, pues es justo las barreras geográficas, ¿no? el agua que eh, pues evita o hace que las aves no migren por ahí que no se generan corrientes termales tan fuertes y del otro lado de la sierra pues es un poquito más complicado también porque hay nubes durante el otoño eh, puede haber lluvia entonces tratan siempre buscan las mejores condiciones para migrar ¿no? y obviamente pues nosotros nos ubicamos abajito de ese cuello de botella no que es donde está el, el, 
en los dos sitios de conteo. And even for the Western birds, like uh, Swinson's hawk, you can see this is a satellite uh, data from, from a few individuals. And just look at the birds from California that they also go to the, to the Gulf of Mexico. And if we go back to the map, is basically this area. So you, you can see this gap. Como pueden ver las aves del oeste también se vienen y pasan justo por aquí entre medio de las sierras, de las dos sierras prácticamente, y cruzan, bajan hacia acá y nuevamente se concentran junto con las demás migrantes que vienen. Y bueno, the, the two sites. So as uh, Ernesto mentioned, this is the two sites, the, um, the Mario Ramos Bird Observatory and the Hotel Bienvenido. They are nine kilometers apart, and we basically can control around 20 or 19 kilometers of the migration on, on, this, uh, on this corridor. ¿Y cómo lo hacemos? Bueno, ya mencionamos, son tres personas. The assistant in the middle and the two observers or the official counters, they are taking care of each side, so east, to an east and west views, basically. And we divide the sky, that's how we, we control. So the person in the middle, the assistant, he's collecting all the data that is overhead and the official counters are providing the information that is on the east and to the west. And we can see here like um, how the topography makes the way and the the key in this project is to have communication we communicate by radio because whatever is passing in between the sites is going to be kind of tricky but with experience that they gather by being several years in, in the project you can learn landmarks you can know to read the clouds so you can, you can even use a cloud as a landmark and say, I have a vortex or a big kettle um, in that cumulus that has the shape of a dog, for example. And then we found the flux and we agree who is going to count who according to the best view. Algo aquí que sí quiero resaltar es um, como pues los dos sitios sí tienen una buena distancia, pero cuando vienen grupos grandes, que pasan entre los dos sitios, ahí la comunicación por radio es muy importante porque ahí nos coordinamos para ver quién ve mejor el grupo que está pasando entre los dos sitios, ¿no? Y entonces, ah, yo puedo identificar incluso este, aguilillas de a las anchas, este, perfectamente bien veo sus colores, ¿no? Entonces, ya ese equipo, ya sea Cardel o sea Chichicaxle, es quien va a, a identificarlos, ¿no? A empezar a hacer el conteo. And, and who, when, and how can count at the river raptors? So basically, this is uh, something that is like in bird watching. Anybody can do it. This is something open for anybody. The, the only requirement is having a good eyes and good coordination. We will see why. And when is everything experienced? Like, if you gather your enough experience, then you can come. And how at least you have to have three years at the Real Raptors being an assistant, uh, that basically that you will have, every person that enters to the project starts like assistant most of the time. And after two or three years, the, the official counters, they can approve and say, well, this person is ready to come and be a counter next year. And also can be people that have experienced counting large flocks of 10 thousands of more birds in a single day or hour, like our friends from uh, Kekoldi, from Panama, from Colombia, and some sites in the States like Corpus Christi. So counters from those places can easily be a counter here as well. And the other is being a very good birder with few more years counting experience. So basically, this project requires, as you can see, already some experience that can be built in the site 
or can be done in other places. And this is the, the training, how we train. So everything starts with the assistance, you know? the assistance or trainees that, that we can have in, in a certain year. And they will go basically through the same lessons. So we get all the information together. And the, the way the assistant begins to count is by being, getting the easy ones. And this is really nice in Veracruz. We count uh, the pelicans, we count wood storks, ibises, hangas. And those are the ones the assistant is counting. I remember when I was an assistant, spending the afternoon basically counting all the waterfall that was flying uh, around. And that's the case for every single person that comes uh, and wants to, to become a counter. And something really important that some people ignore, these are one of the best teachers, the, the white wind dogs in Cardell in the afternoons, we count hundreds of thousands of white wind dogs during migration. And the assistant is basically in charge of also recording and counting and learning how to estimate um, these flocks of white wing dogs. Entonces, creo que aquí sí está muy claro, ¿no? Para eh, esta especie, como pasan muchísimas, entonces es una oportunidad, al igual que las, eh, las cigüeñas o los pelícanos, ¿no? Que nos ayudan a, a, a entrenarnos, porque ahí empieza uno a tener esa habilidad en el clicker, ¿no? Esa, esa capacidad de identificar qué es lo que está volando, van a cierta velocidad, y aprende uno el patrón de, del vuelo, ¿no? And a new things and also something important is the, the use of software that can help us to, to train, to get trained. And we're going to talk a little bit after me with Elio, who's going to tell us what can be found in, in this software. And the assistant also, they learn how to collect weather information in the sites. They collect basically everything. Um, we, we place everything into Ebert. As you can see, we have, a, like for example, in Chichicaxley, 266 species record. And the assistant is the one uh, collecting all that information. And also entering the data uh, in Dunkadu that goes into whole count, which is available for everybody. And, and then learn the silhouettes. So they have to learn and we spend hours and every single day in the count in the stations, reading the, the field guides, talking, discussing about the shape, the behavior, how to, how flaps differently a sharp shin hog than a cooper's hog, how the, how the shape is different. So they learn that, they learn the behaviors, they learn the timing of the migration because you may be entering, I don't know, 50 Greyhawks in September and say, well, Greyhawks in September, Greyhawks migrate basically late October. And yeah, you can get 50 Greyhawks, but in late October, not in September. So once you have that, like who in the public can identify all these silhouettes that I have on my slide? I'm gonna give a few seconds. There is the answer. And these are some of the species that we uh, count here in the, in the project. And what Ernesto was talking, so everything goes by grouping, like with the white wing dogs, people start like with the small groups, but sometimes with the, um, like with American white pelicans, you can count by one. Uh, with the wood storks, you can go by one as well, but sometimes you have to go a little bit more because you have like a flock of 600, for example. And, and yeah, we do the groups, then you click, and then you click, you click, you click, you click. And that's how you end up with your, with your line. But if it's too big like this one, you may want to, like, it depends on the speed. If you have a line that is like this thick, but is really fast, if you go by five, you're gonna lose a lot of birds. Then you have to be sharp and move and better go to 50 or 100. And then 
you, as long as the, once the line gets shorter, then you have to go back to the lowest number. As Ernesto was, was talking, if you go bigger, you're gonna lose numbers. So as long as once that heavy moment pass out, you, you go down, you go to the lower numbers again, to the pluses. And how we manage the clickers. Here's a really nice example. So this counter is holding with the left hand the clickers and holding the binos with the right hand. So in one clicker, you have to have torque vultures, Swain's hog, Broadwing hogs, in the, main, in the month of October, where happens the peak days in here in Veracruz. And then you have to go probably uh, turkey vultures, the ones that fly slower, you can go by five. And the Swainson's hog and um, broadwings that they pretty much fly at the same speed, then you can go by 10, or it depends. If it's not too heavy the line, then you can go by two, you can multiply by five. So that changed but this is the coordination. This is one of the most important in the count. You have to remember, or, or the counter has to be completely uh, used to have one species in, in, like to remember who, which one is my clicker for turkey vulture, or which one is my, my clicker for Swainson's by 10, and which one is my Swainson's by two. And that's, that's the, that's when you know someone has experience because you get used to, and you say, I always want to put in this finger, the turkey vultures. And in this one is going to be always the Swainson hog, for example. And that's, that's how we manage. So after one assistant have learned everything, they know how to identify, they know how to estimate, then this person is read, is ready to count, basically. And everything is only possible with teamwork because as I mentioned, we work three people in each station. So we are total six counting while the other are doing laundry or watching TV and, or going for bird watching. So, but all these six people are counting every day and they have to work as a team, as a unit in order to have this uh, important data collected. And I'm gonna pass to Elio Lagunes, the, the screen, so he can talk us a little bit about um, the software that we have created for everyone to, to see it. Tienes abierto tu Elio, ¿verdad? Yeah. Okay. Ah, sí, sí, aquí lo tengo abierto. Eh... Um, les voy a compartir la pantalla. I'm, I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, just let me show. I'm, I'm going to share this um, this link where you can visit the application here in the chat. So you may want to follow the, the tutorial. Um, and now I'm going to share the screen. Um, just let me. Here it is. The, the big red, the big green button here. Is operating system. So, okay. Allow. Entire screen. Okay. Is my screen being shared with you? See. Sí. Okay, so this is the application we built uh, <clears throat> with uh, with, the, with um, the guidance of Kashmir. This is a very simple um, application that allows you to uh, to check your performance in bird counting, and besides that, it allows you to to track your your advances, your your improvements, and your in your bear counting, um, the it it has a very basic functionality here. It it has this video. You you may also stop the video. It's 
it's intended to be played in uh, on your cell phone, and that's why the 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 screen doesn't fit until you make it like full screen. You may stop the video like this using uh, give, uh, clicking whatever on the video if you want to uh, make a more precise count. And these videos were created um, following Kashmir's Cash instructions. They, uh, he, he said, he told me that that before, like several years ago, they were using a software that had like crosses and, and asterisks and moving through the screen and they would make this estimate. This is a certain number of birds. This, uh, uh, there is this program I, I wrote that makes these videos which is also downloadable here. You can you know you can download the code here at the bottom of the page. Here's the link, and that takes you to 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 where the code is for making these videos. And we uh, we divided this these videos um, regarding the the skills, the level of the observer. We have the beginner, which is the Principiante, and to mimic the, some of the conditions that you would find on field, uh, there's like this sun glare that that we put into the video that um, so let and after you you watch the full video, then you type in the numbers you are estimating. This, the beginner level is only turkey vultures that we have here. And this field is for you to fill with your name or something that you uh, believe that will identify you enough for not being mixed with all the counters here. Um, I don't want to, to put this through an authentication barrier. Um, I want it to be the most uh, simply usable it could be. Uh, I'm going to type my name here. And uh, let's say, as this is only, this is beginning, there's only turkey vultures. And, and my estimate is, let's say, 20. And after you write in your estimate, you click this button. And there's a table that loads with all your, uh, that tracks all of your estimates. And you can see uh, uh, ever since I started here, like answering, this is, this is all of the, all of what I, uh, all of my input. It, it has this formatting, uh, it gives you red or like pink and red for underestimates and blue and dark blue for overestimates. And this can this helps you a little bit to, to make it more visual. And there is also this button where you, the, the button where you can download your your data. And this includes another very important field which is um, which is the date. And this, uh, thus, you can track your improvement if there is any. Uh, I'm, I'm really like not a very good observer here. These are your numbers and the date that uh, when you uh, when you put your estimate. And uh, this uh, and this is the key of the video. There is a total of 21 videos. Um, I could add more, or if you want to to make your own videos with your own uh, numbers, you can. Uh, I'll show you where the. When I, I'm going to follow this link later, in just a moment. And this is the advanced level. This is. It's up to 800 um, uh, raptors. 
the the closer ones, the the, the ones in the bottom, the one the ones that are also moving faster, uh, because this like this is the visual perception. These are the turkey vultures. You have also the swain zones and the broad wing hawks, which are um, on the top of in the up and moving slower. Uh, and, well, maybe they're not moving slower, but th this is just your perception because of the distance. And this will be the, the last uh, in the video to, to pass by. And after you watch the video, you go here and and type your your estimates for each, let's say, 100 of these, 150 swainsons, and maybe 300 turkey vultures. Uh, and this is the the results of the, the video I just watched. Uh, I did a, a, an underestimate uh, for the turkey vultures and overestimate for swainsons and broadwings. And here's a little, just a, a brief uh, description of the application. It has 21 videos, as I mentioned, and three difficult levels. And this that I told you that the name is just for you to, to track your, your improvement. And all the code here is for you to access. And the original idea was from Kashmir and um, the, the, the developer here. And uh, when you come here to the, this is all written in R, which is a very popular language, a programming language. And these are the, the code here for the application. Is the, it, it is a shiny app and does it is uh, made with this server and the UI and this uh, this file and then up set of this is where you make the code there is a description of the this my this is my repository at code repo and you may your field yeah you're totally free to to go and use it we will be constantly like many uh, well one thing that we have is like we have access to what everyone types into so we can compare the the results from different people and um this is uh, our um, well th this was born uh, because of a, an idea cash had and and uh a lack of software that he pinpointed to me that uh, he said that there's not too much software for training observers. There's some uh, software that has a paywall. So I told him, well, what you are asking me is kind of easy to do. It's just like a, a making videos with a certain number of birds with uh, we can control that. And this is how this was born. And I was having a, a curiosity because when he first mentioned it, I, I was more like thinking in this bird soaring um, in, the, in the thermal. And this is something that, that Ernesto, he just cleared. Uh, well, I, I, I knew that already, but Ernesto, he cleared that they do not count them when they are soaring in the thermal. But when they are flying um, uh, between thermals, once they reach the certain altitude, and then they go to the front, and that's and when I went there to to see the uh, the counters in action, the observers. So that's when I it, it all came clear to me that this is how the beaters should look. And well, this would be my part. Thank you. There's the link for you to visit. Muchas gracias, Elio. And now we pass the app. Uh, yeah, you're still sharing your screen. Um, did you have something else, Cash? No, I will uh, just, um, some people ask if this is uh, free. Yes, is anybody can see it, the link 
will be available. I'm sure uh, Jenny or you already can put it in the for everybody's view. So. Yeah, it is so free that you can download it for yourself and you run it on your computer yeah. without us knowing. <laughs> 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 that sounds like a great tool for training the counter. So, uh, well, thanks, Cash, and thanks, Elio. Um, so, we're going to shift gears, go a little farther south through the bottleneck, and uh, let the folks in Kekulde, um tell us a little bit about what they've been doing. And just to remind you, Kekulde is in Costa Rica and it was, has been operating or started in the late, in the early 2000s, but um, took a little hiatus and it's now restarted their count and they're counting both in spring and fall. So kudos to them. Um, and I'd like to introduce David Araya, Araya and uh, Julio Madrid. We're going to talk a little bit about how they did the count there. Hello people here, David Duckin. I am basically a co-director and also a trainer and recruiter for the Watch project. So we're going to start talking about uh, the way we train people here. And first part, the, the recruitment. The recruitment is a whole process that we go through. And it is, of course, uh, in one of our internal uh, documentation for everyone to come, we'll follow the same steps, right? So we have everything there. And, and we also use virtual tools. All this is virtual prior to the visit the site. So, um, that being said, we prior to the counting several months prior to the to the counting season, we go to we go through a whole recruiting process through social media, most likely, in order to bring people interest and apply, right? So we will uh, receive all the resumes in our emails and all the interest from people. And we will take a look at them and of course select the ones that will be suitable for our project. Um, after the selection, we will go to interviews in order to uh, go in deeper into their profiles and uh, make sure that we're, go we're going to choose the right people. Uh, in these interviews, we measure their attitude, their aptitude, and of course their availability because we want to have whole season um, people in our in our account right this has been a really great key to success in our teams and part of this is also well that we try to create a family sense for our people um whoever comes to Kekoli they will have to, will have to leave Kekoli Kekoli is in the mountains of Costa Rica and it's not really easy to get there most of the people that participate to in our projects of, as volunteers, they come from the Central Valley or different places in the country. So they have to live in our scientific scientific center. Uh, so we want them to feel like a family. And uh, again, part of this, uh, the success of our project is this. Uh, as an example, people from the very first batch of members in our account, they are still with us and they're still helping us in the project in several different things, not necessarily counting. Uh, one of those is Julio and also Isa, we have Anna and some other um, members that we are not only, we were not only co-workers in the, in, the, uh, in the project, but we're also friends. Um, part of this is at the very beginning, we create a WhatsApp group which is the most popular way for communication in Costa Rica. So people will feel so comfortable uh, talking to each other. We, we try to build this confidence for them to be able to communicate with all the team, not only Julio, not only me, but anyone. So they will have each other's contact in there. And of course, uh, we will be able to share very important information during the training. To go now um, to the very beginning of the training, we start from the very basics. So we teach them about our, our project. We share them our social media. And we want them to get familiar. So we also uh, include them in our website. They will, this will create a sense of, of, of they will feel more comfortable. 
and more formal way to belong to the process. We want them to get familiar, so we also uh, encourage them to get added into our social media. And of course, they will be there uh, exposed as a part of our team. Most of the times they love this. Um, we also teach them, teach them from the beginning about, about virtual tools, uh, like you know videos, uh, like applications for ID, uh, websites for, uh, for many things related to Raptor migration. And of course, we encourage them to ask us all the questions that they have. So we can, we can uh, uh, create this sense of belonging to the, to the project they will start creating a lot of knowledge from here. <clears throat> uh, now, going straight to raptors, the biology and ecology, this will sound maybe very basic from, from our end, but we have people from every kind of level, from biologists to uh, just people who wants to, to help in a regular project. Maybe they don't have any background in raptors or anything. So we start from, the, from scratch. What is a raptor? Uh, why they are important? When to find them and stuff? And for us to do this again, uh, to recap, all this is virtual before they visit our our project. Uh, so we have a series of videos and also some other stuff where they they will get familiar with raptors. So we introduce them to raptors of uh, in a very broad level. First of all. Uh, uh, anatomy, physiology, uh, and everything, right? So the parts of the raptors, how to even how to use uh, their resources. Uh, then we go through when they can find a raptor, where they are, what they do, and we go very uh, hard in the ID of raptors, which is so important for this kind of project, of course. Uh, we also <laughs> give them homework, and this might sound weird for you, but yes, homework is a really good tool for them to show us their commitment in the project. Uh, so um, they will acquire knowledge in, in their uh, way, right? So they will have their own time. Most of the times when we uh, add people to our, to our uh, team, well, they might before they visit the place they might not have the like the, the same time all together so they have they will have their own time in order to complete these homeworks and this will show us that they are uh that they are interested in the pro in the uh topic that their commitment is measured here they will of course uh, reach uh knowledge they will have new questions and this will also show us they are going through the homeworks in a proper way. And of course, they will become autodidactic, which is very important before they visit the place. Um, so they will learn by, by themselves. Uh, these homeworks are about, about ID, facts, how to use the tools, uh, resources, and stuff. And this has been a very useful for them. Of course, we later on will go deeper into uh, migration dynamics. So we go first of all to the main taxa, uh, the main species that will migrate through Costa Rica, and uh, we go to the numbers. Part of the resources we use is of course hog count. So every single member in our in our project will be able to fill uh, whatever numbers we get in the protocol during the day uh, they will have of course uh, uh, identification test which is so important they will be taught where to find information if they are interested not only information but the latest information um, they will also well again since we have all kind of levels here they will have all the tools and resources in order to learn if they are beginners and they will be they will get very much familiar with Kekaldi's numbers and the way we work. All right, all of this is in our channel and it's actually public as well. A very important to add is that the learning curve uh, 
is going from down to top and of course the learning efforts uh will be better through the time just the same way uh the migration timing works right so raptors will start passing in small quantities right so they will have the chance to learn during this time when we have a low uh, a low amount of raptors going through our head uh in a different way from from veracruz we only count raptors right so this will allow the team to focus on those on those mm -hmm. raptors and also we do it in spring and autumn we we count both seasons so um they will have all the chance to learn during their process and uh, thank you david uh, good evening uh, nice to share with you today my name is julio madrid i am from costa rica and i am the official leader concert uh keko the hog watch project for last four season uh, for me it is a pleasure to share with you today uh, i am going to talk about the work that is done in the observation tower before and during the monitoring of raptors a focus of teaching new trainees <clears throat> sorry as david mentioned before uh, we received previously select volunteer to the counting sites uh, one or two days prior to the beginning of that season <clears throat> On the first uh, day, I performed an analysis of identification and counting skills of each volunteer uh, to measure their knowledge uh, and abilities, signs they might be better and um, finding or scanning uh, or maybe identifying is their strong skill. Taping the information is very important also. Besides this, we have a second make counter to lead a, in the team whenever I am off. I define the person during this time. <clears throat> the second day, the protocol is reviewed in detail in the counting tower uh, to analyze each of the variables and steps to follow up to do this, we will divide it into three parts. And number one, observation effort. Number of counter and the effective counting hours in the observation tower. Uh, you work 10 hours a day from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Costa Rican time. Number two, climate variables. Temperature, wind direction, wind speed, uh, visibility, cow cover, flight direction, and flight distance. Number three, identification, counting, and estimation of raptors. The first thing I teach them is about the basic anatomy of the raptors. For example, coloration, pattern, shapes, Silhouette and behavior of each species is very, very important. Use of the equipment. After this, the correct use of optical equipment, uh, binoculars, telescope, as well as the camera and computer of the project is shown to the new members. To count the species we carry out previous practice uh, with videos simulating the passage of raptor. We use a clicker to write down the number of each species. Found in the tower. We remember that in Kekoldi we have a 17 species of migratory raptor per autumn season. More than 3 million birds are reported. Four species account for more than 98% of the total migration. A Mississippi Kai, Turkey Vulture, a Broken Hawk, and Soison Hawk. The four species form huge groups that will be impossible to count uh, one by one. In this case, we will estimate the group. First, we identify the species in the thermal. Then we assign a clicker for each species. 
we make small groups uh, tend to start um, 30 at most. For example, one clip by 10, uh, 20 or 30. Okay. We make an imagining line in the sky uh, between in the coast and Talamanca mountain. Uh, once the raptor uh, leave the thermal, they are estimated. The other species that migrate in a smaller quantity, such as uh, osprey, falcon, acipiter, will give one clicker per bird. Every year will be at the total of each species and at the end of the day. The overall total and the data is entered in whole count every day. I want to add uh, that we don't know only train our team, but we give follow up to every single country during the hoop, stay by shadowing their work, giving feedback, and working side by side with them. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Did you have more, David? Or that's about it. Thank you very much for your attention. The Thank video you. is optional. We can actually share the presentation to all people that came through the uh, through a link, so you will be able to see it all eventually. Thank you. It's nice. It's nice to see the the view you have. Hmm. Um. Yeah, and I just also want to say uh, express so much gratitude and a huge thank you to all of our speakers tonight. Ernesto, Kashmir, um, Ilio, um, David, and Julio, thank you all so much for sharing um, all of your knowledge and all of the tools you use. Um, it was fantastic. And Lori, I'm wondering, uh, do you wanna move forward with questions while we're watching the video? Sure, I think there was one question that Cash wanted to answer from Rosabelle. Did you see that question, Kashmir? You're on mute, I think. Was it Rosabelle's question about sharing the link, uh, the document to how to use the app? Also, I will. I can also um, email everyone who registered um, the link as well um, that we also just shared in the sh the chat. Okay. Um, all right. I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. Um, people are wanting to get co copies of the presentation. Um, I did have a question about data forms because I think um, in Veracruz that they've used notebooks and other methods and now you're using the tablet, I think. Uh, is Are things getting written down? Um, it looks like in Kekaldi you are using data forms or at the end of the day you have a written form as well as entering it onto Hawk Count. So maybe maybe you could each answer that. Yeah, here in Veracruz, we switched um, in 2016, if I'm not wrong. Uh, we, we stopped using the, the notebook and we collect everything in the on the tablet using Dunkadu, which was uh, fantastic. I remember like we used to have a ton of errors in the in our data sheets, like like because it was uh, getting information from the counters to the notebook. And then the, the, the official counter of the day, after the day was done, we needed to translate, to basically make a translation of whatever the assistant wrote into the data sheet and then copying the information from the data sheet to the database. So we, we used to have like every 20 days uh, data proofing and we found errors from in every in, in every uh, piece of the of the step, like in the notebook, in the data sheet, in the database. And once uh, Dunkadu came up, it was uh, something really uh, really good for us because we didn't need it to to take like two hours after uh, seven p.m dealing with the data sheet and then have dinner by 9 or 10 uh, p.m. 
and having used, if there was an error, was used that day. But every afternoon after the count is done, the upshot counters, they both have to go to the tablet and see what was entered for that day and also go to the eBird checklist to review if any other bird was missing. Remember that we record, we are recording right now every single bird species that can be identified. Um, but we're focused, of course, for the raptors because we get always a priority. So we review that at the end of the day. And then if everything just pops up, oh, I didn't say uh, about the Harris's hog. Why there's a Harris hog in this? Okay, what's in the Northern Harris? And then you get fixed in that very moment, that very uh, afternoon. And then once the data goes to the database, there is no mistakes. Or if there is one, it will be less than it used to be before. And I think Ernesto, you wanted to comment or say say something. Yes, um, I I have my own uh, probably old fashioned uh, ideas about keeping uh, a paper a, a paper printed uh, form in notebooks as uh, as a way that you can backtrace errors. Um, I think redundancy in keeping data is very important when it comes to long term data sets. Uh, we all uh, pass through projects uh, after, uh, it, it, you know, like the River of Raptors has been running for over 30 years and we are all transient over seven years, 10 years and stuff like that. And those errors uh, can be found. Uh, you can go from the notebook to the paper form, from the paper form to the uh, spreadsheet and, uh, and you can trace them. When you are uh, avoiding some of these steps, you are you're saving time, you, you're, you're seemingly uh, becoming more efficient in, uh, in uh, avoiding mistakes, but what you're actually doing is not leaving a trace of a potential mistake on the back. Uh, there is plenty of, of data on, uh, say, uh, Bill Michener's uh, 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 data papers in ecology uh, uh, and general recommendations about keeping uh, printed forms and, and um, notebooks and stuff like that as a way to back up your data. And my, uh, again, old fashioned recommendation is, is to keep uh, multiple copies of, uh, of the different media in which the data are collected. Uh, notebooks are important, forms are important, printed forms are important, and uh, spreadsheets. Um, so um, uh, I'll be uh, willing to share any data that I have on that. It's called information entropy. It's a, it's a whole phenomenon about uh, uh, that, we, that we're living behind by, by trusting our electronics more than we, uh, than we trust the old ways of running things. Yeah. David, do you want to just mention what they're doing in Keckledy? I don't, it looks like you're using paper forms and then at the end of the day, you put it on a computer. Yeah. Old school way. Yes, we, uh, we write down everything in our protocol, which is of course adapted to, uh, to, to our conditions. And at the end of the day, always, I mean, we cannot miss one day. At the end of the day, always the information is in hot count. Day and day. Okay, thanks. Um, Jamie, do you wanna ask the next question? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I saw um, some questions coming in. So let's take a look. Um, so how do you move from counting 10 to counting 100 on the same clicker? Also, is one person in charge of checking if the clickers are working properly every day? I can answer that one. So switching, um, if you're counting by one, then you have to go 10, you just watch your clicker, you shoot the number to your assistant to enter the, the number, and then you put it again to zero. And yeah, there is uh, like, it's everybody's responsibility to be watching the clickers that are in zero all the time when you have to grab new ones and then just give the clicker that has numbers to your assistant because you have to continue counting. But yeah, basically is that. And, and yeah, it's uh, everybody everybody's teamwork to, to, to be watching that those kind of mistakes. 
Awesome, thank you so much. Ernesto, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to quickly say that uh, field assistants uh, play a really important role in uh, keeping everything running uh, smoothly. Uh, I think uh, we tend to think of assistants as doing something of a uh, of a lower level job when they actually are doing something really important, uh, keeping uh, clickers in zeros and, and administering how the site runs is very important. I think Kashmir uh, uh, will not let me exaggerate here, but uh, assistants can often be orchestrators of who is dealing with what flow of migrants. And I will say uh, it's very important that a post communication system such as the one that was just mentioned by, by Cash uh, is kept in place. Wonderful, thank you so much. You know what, I think we got through all the questions. I know some of you were answering the questions. Uh, um, let's see, did something just pop in? Okay, thank you. Just, you know, everyone on the team who presented today, we're just getting lots of compliments in the in the chats and the questions. Um, I just want to thank everyone in the audience for attending. Thank you for caring about Raptors. And again, a huge, huge thank you to all of our speakers tonight. You guys are fantastic. The truth is, as you guys were presenting, in my mind, I kept thinking, these guys are superheroes. <laughs> They're able to do all this. So thank you so much for sharing your skill set. Um, and again, I will email everyone through um, that registered that link again on how to use the app. So if you didn't catch it through the chat and um, thank you again to everyone. And as always, we like to kind of just close with a little update as to what is happening at Hawk Mountain during our spring migration. I also want to let everyone know we do have an idea fund for inclusion, diversity, equity and accessibility to remove any barriers or financial barriers that may exist. So if you are interested in experiencing Hawk Mountain, um, and you think you uh, could be related to the, our idea fund, please contact myself uh, or Mary Linkovich, our development director. And we are in spring migration, so come visit us every weekend um, through the end of May. We have live Raptor programs, and up through uh, mid-May, we have many other free educational programs as well. Um, we have a wonderful Appalachian a geology field course coming up this weekend. And also April 29th is National Go Birding Day. Um, we have on May 5th, Accessible Warbler Walk. Uh, May 5th, we also have a Moonlight Hike, which is member exclusive. It's basically Warbler Weekend, <laughs> the first weekend in May at Hawk Mountain. So we also have a Warbler Walk on May 6th, um, as well as the Wonders of Wildflowers program. And May 7th, we also have another Warbler Walk. And May 12th is our, our big fundraiser, our benefit for the birds. So thank you again so much. Uh, to everyone and we hope to see you at Hawk Mountain soon and thank you again to all of our very talented panelists uh, tonight. Thank you so much and this is bye for now. Thank you everybody. Bye. Muchas gracias. Bye. Buenas noches.